Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar on livestock mortality composting by Lynn Carpenter Boggs and Rachel Weemey of Washington State University. Dr. Lynn Carpenter Boggs is a soil scientist and professor who teaches courses on sustainable soil management and organic agriculture. Her research includes carbon footprints of agriculture, nitrogen fixation, compost teeth, compost livestock integration, and other aspects of biointensive agriculture. Dr. Rachel Weemey is a soil scientist and postdoctoral research associate. Her research is focused on sustainable agriculture, particularly on measuring and promoting soil health. Her recent work includes a study of organic crop rotations with quinoa for Eastern Washington, and she she also works on improving communication of scientific research for public policy. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand over the presentation to Dr. Lynn Carpenter Box. Hi, thanks everyone for joining us. I will uh, mention before we get into the material that we also have uh, contributions embedded within today's talk from several uh, producers and composters. Jason Sheehan from j &K Dairy, April Thatcher from April Joy Farm, and Rick Finch, who among other things, manages the composting facility at the WSU Pullman campus. The material that we will go over today uh, begins with why one would compost mortalities. We will talk about what composting is in general and why it works. Get into more details about materials that can be used and how they are managed. Then more specifically into uh, uh, mortality management, mortality composting management, and using that compost once it's uh, ready to use. We will then spend a little time talking about permitting and regulatory issues and end with some additional resources and sources of support. So let's begin with why one would compost livestock mortalities. Well, if you have livestock, at some point you are likely to have some dead livestock. And uh, because we're in Washington, we will occasionally um, use Washington examples. Um, but Regardless of where you are, um, your timeline might be 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours, but the message is that if there is a dead livestock, a dead animal that you are responsible for, that body needs to be dealt with very quickly in order to avoid odors or spread of disease. So again, depending on where you are, you might have options for burial, rendering, and landfilling. But let's hear from a couple of our producers about why they choose to use composting. I'm Jason Sheehan, one of the owners of J&K Dairy, partners with my wife, Karen, and her parents, Tony and Brenda Vega. We milk about 3,000 cows on two facilities in Sunnyside, Washington. The reason that we chose uh, to compost on our farm was because we felt like it was probably the most natural way of taking care of animal mortalities and we could uh, take them through the full cycle of uh, using them as fertilizer on the fields and, and uh, doing what seemed to be one of the most humane ways of dealing with, with the animals. We'd started composting uh, manure in general on our dairy, I think about 15 years ago. And then it seemed like the natural progression to also compost the mortalities. You know, quick and easy way of dealing with them. You could deal with them when you needed to. We were having some issues getting the rendering services to show up in a timely fashion, particularly in the summer. So this way, if we did have a mortality, we could deal with it immediately. My name is April Thatcher and I own and operate April Joy Farm. Uh, my operation, I have um, two and a half acres of mixed vegetables. I've got fruit trees, I've got chickens, I've got donkey manure, a lot of different materials that I want to compost. 
the reason we use compost is really close cycle. Um, we really want to keep that fertility cycling on our farm. I don't like having to buy inputs to add to my system. Anything I can do to keep those nutrients cycling on my farm um, makes my operation more, more viable, but also it helps reduce my risk levels. And this, especially it's the case with the animal mortality. And it's, it seems foolish to have to pay to, to cart that off the farm to dispose of it somewhere when it's full of rich, awesome, amazing <laughs> nutrients um, that we will, you know, could easily use in our vegetables or to, to make our soil healthier. If you're listening today, you're probably curious about using composting for livestock mortalities. So let's talk a little bit about what composting is and why it works. Composting is an aerobic decomposition of organic materials. And essentially, any organic materials can be used. But this decomposition is happening in mass or in a large volume and mass. And that changes the microbiology of what happens and it changes the resulting product. During composting, there's a transformation of the organic raw materials biologically, chemically, and physically to create this compost that looks very substantially different and is biologically and chemically substantially different from the starting materials. The main inputs that we use in composting are commonly called feedstocks. And while there are a whole range of nutrient elements in these, we talk mostly about the amount of carbon and nitrogen as being key to um, providing a nutritious food for microorganisms to do this decomposition process. Those microorganisms also need sufficient oxygen and moisture to become very active. Once they become active, they go into an absolute feeding frenzy, degrading these feedstocks. In that process, it produces heat. Now what's special about composting is that there needs to be enough materials that there is self-insulation of, uh, of that material and of that heat. So the temperature actually builds up inside too. Because of that, the microbial community actually changes. And when we have the finished product of compost, there's not only less carbon, less volume and mass of material. In, in fact, approximately half of the material should be gone, but it's substantially more stable. The microorganisms have built up some humic acids, so the material is much darker. And because of the heat, we have very low populations of pathogens and weed seeds. So we've talked a little bit about high carbon and high nitrogen feedstocks. And let's just look at some examples of those that are commonly available on farms or maybe nearby. Um, some great materials would be wood chips, wood shavings, rejected feed or spoiled silage or haylage, um, straw, especially material that's been used as bedding is excellent for composting. And those red stars, the wood chips uh, and straw, uh, those indicate that those are especially good materials for forming a base of compost. Um, as we'll see throughout this, um, to encourage high heat production in compost, the aeration is very important. So it's common to build a base of materials like wood chips and straw to support um, porosity underneath the composting material. And then you should also have access to high nitrogen feedstocks. These materials are important for increasing the heat, provides a lot of nutrient value, but also can be potential sources of odor. 
If you have livestock, you likely have some manure. You may have separated solids from that manure, depending on your uh, processing. Um, on or nearby your farm, you may also have materials like food waste that has a lot of, of nitrogen. And the animal carcass itself is a source of a lot of nitrogen because of all that protein in the body. And we want to encourage you um, at, at this point to um, utilize the, the chat. And as, Ale, Ale, um, as Alice mentioned, if you hover over the bottom of your screen, you should see an option for chat. And if you select the two all panelists and attendees, then people can see what you put into the chat. I want to just encourage you to type in some information about uh, what feedstocks you may have available, whether those are high carbon, balanced, or high nitrogen. If we can go back to the, the list now. So because all farms are going to have different potential feedstocks available and they fill different roles within composting. Um, if you had composting classes before, you may have seen high nitrogen materials referred to as the greens and high carbon materials referred to as the browns. But the high nitrogen materials include, again, the mortalities themselves. Chicken manure is very high in nitrogen. Uh, on the other end, the browns or high carbon material would be things like uh, straw and wood chips. Manures um, and hays tend to be somewhere in the middle. They may be more balanced materials in terms of their carbon and nitrogen. Um, but uh, horse manure especially tends to be uh, fairly well balanced, meaning it can compost well on its own. But again, I encourage you to um, share your um, information in the chat box, um, sending that uh, to all panelists and attendees, uh, showing us uh, what kinds of materials you may have available. Like on my little farm, I have high N chicken manure. Okay. So depending on what feed stocks are available to you, you may be you may have access to well balanced material, um, but it's very common that operations will need to blend your feed stocks. So the ideal mixture or individual material for composting is going to have about 50 to 60 percent total moisture a carbon to nitrogen ratio of 25 to 30 to 1, a fairly neutral pH, not very acidic, not very alkaline, and uh, again allows sufficient airflow for aerobic activity. The picture uh, to the right here shows some blended materials and we want to show you that um, uh, one way that these materials can be blended on the farm. Hi, I'm Rick Finch. I'm the manager of WSU Waste Management, which includes the WSU Compost Facility. Um, and I've been with the WSU Compost Facility since its beginning in uh, 1994, I believe it was. At the WSU facility, we have a recipe of, of our compost mix. And, and we have a special mix for the for the uh, mortality composting and we have a pile of it sitting at all times ready so that you know when something comes in we can we can put stuff away immediately and um, but we're we're a combination of animal manure uh, bedding which includes kiln dried shaving straw um, some feed in it um, we're very little yard waste but except for the woody prunings and use those as feed stocks and to make plenum uh, to help disperse the air in the carcass composting. So we, we have a high carbon uh, feed stock mix.
we have different basic recipes for the winter and the summer. And in the winter, we're adding dry material, and in the summer, we may be adding straight water to maintain a certain amount of moisture because most of the process takes uh, place with single cell organisms and they need the moisture in the material to do their thing. Once we have the materials uh, compiled and, and uh, our feedstocks built up, the compost material is going to increase in temperature. And what's shown in the picture here is just a static pile, meaning that it's not being uh, actively turned. And a static pile like this may, may require six months to a year to go through a composting cycle. That temperature should heat up within a matter of days to at most uh, two weeks. And it's critical that we get uh, two or above 131 Fahrenheit, which is 55 Celsius. This hot phase might last uh, two months to maybe even six months, and gradually that temperature will start to decline. Then we go through a longer, still warm phase called the curing phase. That will again last a, a couple of months up to a year. Now that hot temperature is really important for several reasons. This is where some human management comes in. The temperature should be monitored and documented that you've had at least three consecutive days um, at 131 to 170 Fahrenheit. If it's too cool, it means that you don't have effective composting you're not going to get a good reduction in pathogens. If it's too hot, there's some risk of spontaneous combustion, meaning you could have smoke or fire. It's not very common, but you don't want it to happen. So if you reach 171, it's too hot, you'll need to add water and or open up the pile to reduce that temperature. Now, on most operations, at some point, there will be turning or mixing. When you have a livestock carcass in the material, you likely will not do this for at least four months after you put the carcass in. But at some point, to uh, help blend the material and ensure that all of it has gone through um, good decomposition, it's common to turn that material. When you do that, you're also incorporating more oxygen and bringing fresh, some fresh feedstocks to the microorganisms. You will likely see a temperature increase when you do that turning. But uh, over time, the amount of temperature increase is gonna decline, showing that the microbes have used up most of their foods. And with that, Rachel is going to tell us more about specifics of materials and management for livestock mortality composting. Right. So now that we've thought about the types of materials that we need and the temperatures we need to reach, we're going to look more closely at the process of when we're dealing with those animal mortalities and what steps we need to take in order to compost them effectively and safely. Um, I will say definitely there are numerous ways that this can actually be carried out and they will likely look different depending on each operation, depending on, the, like I said, those materials you have, what type of livestock and equipment and space, etc. But what we'll cover today are some of these basic examples through which we'll understand the key principles that are going to be applied no matter which of these systems listed here that you'll be using on your operations. So starting with one of the most basic or simple maybe methods we can say, we're gonna look at static piles. So this is also a very versatile method that can be used with lots of different types of livestock depending on what you have. Um, so the key points here, starting on our impervious surface, we want to lay down a large, thick, 
base of high carbon and high absorbent material. Um, the key here is that it is at least about two feet high, usually, especially for like in this example, these larger animal mortalities, cows and horses. We want that thick and we want it large enough so that we can lay the carcass in the middle and still have plenty of space around the edges of the carcass as well. This is gonna be important because in this third step, when we add the material on top, we wanna to make sure we can get enough material on top that during the process, the weeks and months of breakdown, that carcass will break down and the material will move. And so it will be important that there's enough space that the carcass is not too close to the edge and becoming exposed during that breakdown process. Um, the covering on top of our blended or balanced feedstock in order to um, work with this carcass, we also want that plenty thick. So putting about two feet or 60 centimeters of material on top of that carcass, that, because that material is also acting as a biofilter in, in catching and absorbing and keeping maintained the odors that might become possible from this carcass, um, as well as insulating this pile, as Lynn mentioned, to keep that temperature high all throughout the pile, especially in areas with colder temperatures for some times of the year, you might want even more material to ensure that most of the center of the pile reaches those temperatures. So we're just going to reiterate once again the importance of that base material. Um, for this, you want to use your highest carbon material have it plenty thick because it needs to balance the high nitrogen and the high moisture from that carcass. So we want it thick enough to be able to absorb some of the moisture that's going to come from that carcass, but also think about the particle size of this base material to allow for aeration to continue throughout this pile as well, especially if you're not adding a, any type of aeration, and this is going to just be a static pile, thinking about the air movement through this pile. So moving up in scale, possibly, if you either have a larger scale with higher rates of routine mortality, or if you would use composting in events of high deaths, such as natural disasters or disease outbreaks, you can also take that concept of a static pile and extend it into rows um, just by adding, extending out the base and adding each mortality as it occurs, covering up each one. So just some things to note for this, ma making sure that you still, no matter how you lay these out, leave room to maneuver your equipment and be able to access all parts of the pile. Again, during that breakdown process, just in case you need to add materials on top, being able to maneuver equipment in there, and also allow airflow between and around these piles. Um, with any operation, of course, it's a good idea to keep detailed records as well. This is a long-term process, and depending on your operation, that might be something necessary for reporting if that is required in your area. So moving back a little bit in the other direction, another option you might see is talking about composting in bins or in stalls, like you see here. So something that's a little bit more constructed or contained system. So in these systems, again, it's the same principles, um, but you often see it laid out. So for example, in layers, these might work well with things like poultry operations. We'll see a, a diagram of that in a minute, but even up to mid-sized livestock as well in these bins, but they can be, um, added in layers, or like with something like butchery waste, added in layers up until the top of these bins, and then be turned and moved after a few months within these bins. Um, this structure can allow for some additional control, like you see in this one, having a roof. If you need more moisture management, for example, this one being located in the high rainfall area in Western Washington, um, it needs a little more control of keeping these piles at the right moisture level. And also with these contained systems, you'll often see ways to add aeration 
um, into the bottom of these bins because these sides are closed off. And again, that aeration is really important and can help speed up the composting process. Um, looking at back at some of these examples with a static pile being expanded into rows, you can have the option of adding different types of aeration. And again, this is important because those microbes that are doing all of this breakdown process need oxygen in order for that process to continue. So it can become a limiting factor if there's not enough air moving through your pile. So by adding either a passive system, by putting perforated pipes throughout the base material that you have under your livestock, or even a next step of adding um, active aeration by adding a fan or a blower that can force air into a pipe and up through the, the process, or up through the pile, can help speed up this process. So we're gonna take a look at what um, those basics might look like applied specifically to two different operations. So starting first with April's. We were able to partner with our, con our conservation district to find funds to build the structure and it was a cost share arrangement. We chose aerated composting simply because uh, I have a small operation, I don't have a lot of labor um, at my disposal to turn and move um, compost and so having the system you know help help me heat up the pile and manage the composting process without having to do a lot of physical labor to, to churn it was really appealing and that has been um, absolutely critical to our success in terms of especially livestock um, composting. So when we build our piles we um, use wood chips, big thick coarse wood chips, so we'll put um, probably six inches to a foot maybe of wood chips we cover the bottom of the bay, not all the way to the edge of the walls, but just we keep it right in the, the center. Um, the wood trips create a lot of interlocking like air space for the air to blow up through that into the pile. So we don't put those wood chips all the way to the wall because then what happens is the air blows up into the wood chips and it takes the path of least resistance, which is out to the edge of the wall and straight up. So we want the air to be forced to go right through the center of the pile. Every pile is kind of its own unique being. It's not always the same ratio of materials. It, it does vary. It's more trial and error, but it, it's, it's more you have to just use the good principles of greens and browns and um, work at making those layers um, as best you can. The addition of the carcasses actually has improved the compost because it's added a really great source of nitrogen um, and it seems to help the piles heat up. The things that I have learned is that it makes, with, with using carcasses, um, it really makes the size of the mater other material that you're composting with those carcasses more important. So more um, smaller and more uniform size material really helps offset this big mass of a chicken body or a pig carcass, right? So it's much better to shred my, my dry or my brown materials and, and um, add the, the carcasses in those so that they're really kind of tucked in. And generally it takes me a, a probably anywhere from one to three months to build a pile. I usually cap it over with some old, uh, with some compost from an older pile or um, leaf mulch. Then it actively will compost anywhere from um, another two months to probably four months if I can keep it that long in there. Um, and then we do turn it. We do put it in the next, in another bay. There's not a lot of remains. Um, chickens, there's hardly anything left. Um, our pigs, there's definitely big bones, you know, um, is really usually what we see. And then that cooks in the second bay for, you know, it could sit there for six months, even longer if we have the time. And next, we'll look at the process and the timing and how it looks different on a larger dairy in central Washington. 
from Jason Sheehan. A lot of what we try to do is we try to use the dry material, usually a kind of straw or corn stalks on the bottom, something that would have been composted but needed more manure to be composted and more moisture. So it's a perfect scenario for putting as a bottom layer. And we try to get that at least three to four feet. So there's a, a good amount of material. And if there is any breaking down and leachate with the animal, that a lot of that dry material will soak it up. And we, we lay the cow or the animal in that dry material. And then we use somewhat of a material with more moisture to it, um, usually some manure or some manure from our separator. Um, you don't want it to be so wet that it seals over and doesn't allow air to move throughout, but you've got to have some moisture to help break down the cow. So we cover it up. We have three feet underneath and try to have at least three to four feet on top. We do single layer just because it, by the time you put the bottom and the animal and the top, you're, if you're doing it right, you should be at least eight feet tall in the center and it's hard to get it much taller than that on a mature animal. We continue to extend the row so we've, we've got rows and we um, add to the rows so it can take quite a while to make a row so that's why once the temperatures drop at the beginning of the row we just let that row sit and we basically have got to wait for the last animal to get to the point where they're ready to turn. It varies by the time of the year but we try to leave them there for four to six months before we start doing any turning. Um, a lot of it is we're trying to let the temperatures cool down because when your temperatures are cooling off that means the natural composting of the animals done and it needs some air turned in there. We have a company that comes in and does the compost turning and then we try to turn every couple weeks depending on temperatures you track the temperatures and when the temperatures start cooling off you turn it again uh, once you turn it and the temperatures don't rise anymore, that means that the process is complete. It states in our nutrient, dairy nutrient management plan that we need to utilize the compost, compost on our own land. So we've got, uh, we use it on our crop ground that's under our nutrient management plan. So it's pretty easy. It's just kept it separate. We screen it and then we apply the compost to the fields that need it. So as we've heard multiple times now, obviously this process is going to vary on each operation, mainly depending on the type of livestock that you have. Uh, but there are also some other considerations we want to point out for, for different species of livestock. Um, you heard a little bit about thinking about bones. Uh, the larger livestock you have, obviously some of those are going to have very large bones and those will take more time to break down. Um, they also become much harder to break down once they are exposed. So if you go to turn your piles um, and you still have bones remaining, you can screen those out and put them back into that pile or at the end back into another active pile to try and help continue that breakdown process. Um, there are also some differences based on the type of fur or fiber or hair for various species. So knowing that um, if you're trying this with sheep, especially if you put in an unshorn sheep or things like llama and alpaca fiber, do take more time as well to break down, more time and temperatures to, to break those down. Like also with horse hair, will take a little bit longer than the rest of the hide and fur to break down. Another thing that might vary by species is considering the type of diseases that may be the cause of death. Um, as mentioned earlier, the high heat in compost is effective for control against most bacterial and viral pathogens, for example. So here's an example of for in the Midwest in 2015 with the large avian flu outbreak, there were about 50 million poultry that were culled and composted as part of the process to control that virus. So that is an option for certain diseases. So once you have your pile set up and your composting begins, the microbes take over most of the work for the next few months. However, it's not something that you can just set up and completely walk away from. There are things to check for that, so you need to be checking on your pile routinely in order to ensure some biosafety things. As I said, there will be natural breakdown as this 
and as Lynn mentioned, the end product will be about half of the mass of the end volume of the materials going in. So while that process happens, there can be things that would leave parts of the carcass exposed and that needs to be remedied immediately. It can also happen as a byproduct of natural events such as high winds or heavy rains. So for example here we see just the day after this cow was added to the pile we had heavy rains and ended up exposing the head of that cow. Um, that of course was fixed that day but again it's something you need to be able to access your piles and ensure that this doesn't happen. For one thing, any exposed part of the carcass obviously is going to increase odors, which can be a nuisance issue for neighbors, but it's also a biosecurity issue as it will attract more pests. So if animals in your area discover what's in your pile, by, by usually by those odors, they can become a problem. Um, even things just as this, this little magpie can move an amazing amount of material once it figures out what's in a pile. Um, same thing for hawks and eagles, coyotes, or neighboring dogs and cats. So again, just ensuring that you can check on your pile and keep all parts of that um, covered up ensures that you can meet your performance standards that are necessary to do this pro process, but also ensures that this process goes smoothly and that it ends up with, gives you an end product that's easier and safer for you to use. So that brings us to this part where we hope to use our end product of mortality compost. One of the first questions might be, how can I tell when it's ready? How do I tell when it's done? Um, the thing with composting is that it doesn't really end. Um, as we said, the decomposition will slow dramatically. And so there is, that is the sign to look for to know when it's ready, but it will continue this decomposition process in perpetuity. But the things to look for, like we mentioned, are those temperature drops, and especially that it does not significantly reheat after multiple turnings or when it's turned. Um, at this point, there also should be low or no odor coming from this material anymore. You should no longer be able to smell ammonia from it. It's going to be much darker in color from the buildup of the humic acids. Um, and so, as we said, on a commercial facility where a lot of times they have active aeration and active turning, this process can be completed in as few as three months to a year. On a farm, it's usually generally going to take a, a bit longer and be at least six months to over a year time before it is cured and ready to use. So as we heard, one of the common reasons of performing this composting process is because it creates a product that has benefits to soil to use on your farm. So what are those benefits? It is a source of nutrients, both macro and micronutrients in that, um, in that material. It often provides a slight neutralization of soil pH. It is shown to increase your soil moisture holding capacity through improvements in soil tilth and soil structure. Additionally, it provides biotic inoculant food and food and habitat for that biology. So that it's a great source of bringing more biology and microbes into your soil and also providing continued food and habitat for those microbes to continue thriving. So, to note though, if it is being used as a fertility, it does act differently than other fertilizers that you might be used to using. So compost is a slow release in terms of fertility and fertilizer. So in this example, we can see it can take a few years for only about half or getting to the point where half of that material or those nutrients are available for plants to use but it provides all of those benefits we mentioned earlier all throughout over time in your soil. And finally, um, when using mortality compost, we also need to consider um, certain steps that you're following, your permitting or exemption conditions on the distribution or possibly the need for testing of that material. So 
Um, in some cases, for example, in, in this is a, an example in Washington, um, certain types of material may not be allowed on ground that will grow root crops within three years. Um, however, some mortality composts may be used on organic crop, crops, but you'll want to check with your certifier on that. Um, some, there has been some concern about drugs and, and breakdown in compost, um, but studies have shown that drugs do primarily break down or, and or become strongly absorbed to the compost material over time. So antibiotics or painkillers, for example, break down fairly quickly and with the high temperatures of compost, um, and even euthanasia drugs, if that's an issue for animals on your operation, have been shown to become less bioavailable over the time of the composting process. And another thought, important thought, is to make sure that you are cleaning your equipment, any equipment that's used for application of your mortality compost, or th even throughout the process, you're turning, and, and moving that mortality compost, make sure to clean that equipment, especially if it's going to be used again for something like moving animal feed. You want cleanings between those processes. So I'll hand it back to Lynn now to talk about our next topics. Thank you, Rachel. All right, so if you are still curious about using compost mortality Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. Uh, we should consider before beginning any, uh, any composting, um, particularly mortality composting, of whether we need a permit. This is going to vary depending on where you are. The good news is that many agricultural operations are going to be exempt from additional permitting, but the rules will vary by state. For instance, in Washington, there are exemptions when all of the feedstock is generated on site and all of the final product is used on site. You would also be exempt even if some of the feedstocks are collected from off site, but all of the finished material is used on site, and there's a relatively small amount of, of material um, at any time. Um, less than 1,000 cubic yards. Uh, dairies are also uh, going to be exempt as long as they have that composting included within their certified dairy nutrient management plan. Now it's important to note that even if your operation is exempt from permitting, there may still be requirements for reporting to your state department of agriculture or local health department you may be required to do testing of the finished material, particularly if you're going to um, uh, move that material off of your farm. You may need to um, notify the users of the material uh, of the kinds of feedstocks that were incorporated. And as Rachel mentioned, there could even be restrictions on using that material. So before you begin, make sure that you clarify which exemptions apply to your operation, which permits that you need, and other requirements. Everyone, uh, even if you don't need a permit, should expect that if a local official asks to inspect your livestock mortality uh, uh, composting operation, you will need to comply with that request for inspection. If you're producing livestock, you should be well aware of what are called reportable diseases. Um, so there's a list for different species by each state. Um, and uh, these uh, reportable diseases are usually highly communicable diseases such as anthrax. Bodies like that cannot go through normal disposal processes and need to be reported and there may be restrictions on how those carcasses need to be managed. Um, there are some disease agents that are not um, thoroughly destroyed by composting, but the well-known example is um, 
of prions such as scrapie and mad cow disease. Everyone should also be maintaining records. So what are the dates that mortalities were entered into composting? What are the temperatures being reached? And when is each pile being turned? Again, regardless of whether you need to report that, it's really useful information for your own management. And to meet general performance standards. This means that you should be designing, constructing, operating, and eventually closing that facility, <clears throat> even if it's on your own farm, in a manner that doesn't pose threats to human health or the environment. Now those performance standards also primarily just reiterate the kind of management that leads to good composting. Because good composting isn't rotting, it's not fermenting, it's not terribly stinky, <laughs> odorous, and it very definitely is not on fire. Um, these kind of problems mean that there's a problem in building the pile or managing the pile. Um, odorous, um, uh, odorous volatiles coming from compost or if the material is rotting or fermenting, those kind of problems suggest that there's too much nitrogen, uh, too much moisture, and or not enough carbon, not enough airflow. If you have combustion or smoke, that again indicates that for one thing, you're not monitoring that temperature and likely it is either um, too dry and or the pile is simply too big and producing too much heat. The location is extremely important. Again, something that you need to think about and plan long before you actually begin composting mortalities. Things to consider include the security or accessibility. And part of that is transport of the materials and the finished compost. So you need to make sure that it's in a place where the people and materials that you want to and need to reach that site can easily get there and quickly get there. But that, the, um, that anybody else is not, does not have easy access to that site. Meeting performance standards is also part of selecting your location. It needs to be in an area, uh, whether that's natural and or engineered um, and, and uh, worked into the structures that, for instance, control water runoff and leachate so that you're not contaminating groundwater and there's very uh, essentially no risk of, of uh, contaminating waters. And location is also part of your odor management or odor reduction. Understand where your primary winds are coming from and going to so that nearby neighbors are not likely to um, com complain about odors. Let's hear from some of our uh, operators about their site selection. I, site selection, you know, when you're starting out is extremely important. You have to be very conscious of, uh, of water sources that are around, um, you know, freshwater sources, groundwater sources. You know, I recommend, uh, you know, siting away from surface water. Um, our site is, is designed in such a way that it is diked to prevent any uh, water or leachate from running from the site off of the site and to prevent excess water from running onto the site from off site. So we manage the water that falls on the site, but only the water that falls on the site. Um, we're lucky because, um, you know, we had the funding when we started the facilities to have a hardened site. So we're on four acres of asphalt. Also, uh, you know, you don't want to be completely up on a hilltop because, you know, that generates higher wind speeds and it does uh, create more material movement. But on the other hand, you don't want to be down in a hole where 
odors accumulate and then, uh, you know, pick up and move with an inversion as temperatures change, you know, and so, you know, in a space where there is some air movement, but not too much, uh, you know, is, is a little more ideal and our, our site does work for that. You don't want to site it, you know, near where you have a lot of neighbors that are going to be, um, you know, very sensitive to new odors because, you know, no matter what you do, there's going to be, be some when you're handling material. We've got composting sites already in general on both facilities. And so those compost sites drain any uh, liquid would drain towards our lagoons. And so what we do is we make sure that uh, the, the compost mortalities are always closest to the lagoons and none of that leachate, if there was any, would go into our other compost. Siting the compost structure is really a crucial piece of any operation because it can make the job quick and efficient or it can make it laborious and um, more difficult. We wanted it adjacent to where <laughs> the inputs were coming. I mean, ideally that's where you want it, is right next to where whatever it is you're composting is, is being generated. Um, we also made sure that uh, any nutrients that might um, be draining from the structure, you wanna be careful about where that's going and how that's affecting the water quality of the fields or land below and around it. So. Um, we wanted that, we, we sited it in a little higher area and then created a, a actual swale um, to collect any runoff that might occur. Um, and mine is set on a hill, so it's actually really um, great because it's notched into the side of the hill. So the, on the upper side, I can use the wheelbarrow to come straight out of the barn and dump into the back side of the piles and the front side. Um, I can, you can drive up with the tractor, open the doors and dump. And Great. And with that information, we want to just leave you with some additional resources and, and uh, sources of support. Again, it's very important that you contact local officials just make sure uh, whether or not you need a permit or to do any sort of testing or reporting. Some critical contacts would include your local health department, your state department of agriculture, and conservation districts. There are many wonderful sources of information on, uh, on the web now. Uh, we at WSU have produced an extension bulletin that you see here that can be downloaded for free. Cornell created a, a one-page poster that summarizes everything about mortality composting on one page. On the other end of the spectrum, there's a, a long, about 30-plus page um, booklet from APHIS about mortality composting that gets into a lot more detail about disease concerns and health, uh, health and safety management. And there may even be funding available to prepare your site or those structures. The most likely sources um, of support that you should check with would be your local conservation district and NRCS office. With that, we have some time for questions. And also, if you uh, are listening to this, we would ask that you complete, uh, complete a survey and evaluation. It's very useful to us and to our funders, uh, which has been the Washington State Department of Agriculture, to know uh, what parts of this have, have been useful and what other resources are needed. And uh, many thanks again, uh, not only to our funders, but to our contributors, Rick Finch, Jason Sheehan, and April Thatcher. Thank you, Lynn and Rachel. That was a really informative and useful presentation. And um, we're now gonna move on to our question and answer period. And if you have a question, you can just type it into the Q&A box or the chat box on your screen, and we'll be reading them out loud until we run out of time. Um, so we have about 20 minutes left or so. 
So if you don't see the Q&A box or the chat box, there's a bar with some controls at the bottom of the screen. And if you just hover over the screen, um, you should be able to click on them and pull it up. And I just wanted to mention also that this um, presentation is recorded. And if you want to go back and look at it again, it will be available in approximately a week on the eOrganic YouTube channel. So um, I'm just going to move on and look at the question box and the chat box. Thank you to those who entered what you use for um, composting on your farm. We had some contributions there. High, uh, we have uh, high nitrogen uh, materials um, such as chicken and cattle manure and wood chips. Other people use wood chips and bedding from the sheep barn and biochar, uh, chicken manure mixed with straw bedding material and sheep manure and soiled hay. So um, thanks for those. Okay, so uh, moving on to the questions. Do you recommend lancing large animals to prevent bloating? Lancing is not necessary. Um, I don't know of any, um, you know, large operators who, who lance the body. Um, it may, it, it would only be a concern if there's not a lot of material covering the body. So what, what you may see is that um, the, the pile overall is, is a little bit larger while the body is, is bloating and then deflates. Um, I have never observed that process to be um, problematic. Um, and again, I, I really don't know uh, anybody who, who lances the, the bodies. Okay, um, we have a couple of questions related to BSE disease, bovine spongiform, and I don't know if I can pronounce it. Encephalopathy. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, that's great. Um, I don't say that very often. Okay, so the first question is that there's a risk that the manure will contain prions for BSE disease, and if the same loader is used um, as for feeding or spreading manure on a meadow. Okay, so the question was, if the same loader is used, um, is there a risk for um, spreading BSE, um, especially if you don't have the right temperature? Right, so again, composting should not be used for animals that have died of prion diseases, including BSE. There, there has been research showing that um, some of the prions degrade, but uh, on the order of maybe 90%, not to the degree that gives good biosafety assurance. So first of all, we truly do not recommend composting for animals that have, have died of prion diseases. Um, commonly, those animals are going to be either incinerated or landfilled with a large amount of lime um, added over the body. That extremely alkaline condition uh, is a way to um, inactivate the prion. So if you, if you suspect that uh, there may be BSE um, contaminating any of your equipment, um, you know, I, I recommend that you, you contact your, your state um, Department of Agriculture to, to talk about that. Um, and it's not my specialization, but I know that, again, extremely alkaline solutions um, are a way to inactivate the prion. Okay, so that may partly answer the next question, which is, what about the risks of BSE if cows eat grass that grow on, grows on a field that received compost made out of dead cows? Yeah, so this is certainly one of the reasons why it's, it's not recommended. So I, again, there is um, some breakdown of the prions, but not complete. And um, uh, with other prion, uh, prions, uh, the, the uh, prion that causes blue tongue in deer, uh, that's been, that's known to um, last, for instance, on, on leaves of plants. So definitely not recommended. Okay, um, could you share some more details about um, aeration, passive aeration with pipes or tubes, um, like the parameters, the pile size, the composition, the effectiveness, the differences, the limitations? I don't know if those, that kind of information is contained in some of those resources on the presentation. And by the way, we will send you um, a link 
to the recording um, and that should have where you can find all of these um, different publications on it. Um, but yeah, um, is that information in mm -hmm. there or do you want to discuss that some more? So, somewhat. Um, you, you, that information certainly is, is uh, findable. Um, there's a little bit of that information in our extension bulletin. There also are um, agricultural engineers who specialize in building composting facilities for farms. Um, and we, we don't endorse specific companies, but one that I know of is O2, Compo O2 Compost. Um, for using a more passive system, What's usually used is a perforated pipe, um, the kind of pipe that's often used for um, drain fields, um, for, uh, for um, uh, yeah, drain, drain fields uh, for, for housing. So usually about a six inch diameter perforated pipe. And uh, you wanna make sure that the ends of those pipe um, stick out beyond the composting feedstocks themselves. So those ends of the pipe are open to the air, so the air can, can easily flow in through, through the ends. And what happens is because there's a lot of heat in the center, that naturally um, wicks the, the, the heat um, up through the center of the pile and pulls fresh air out, um, pulls fresh air in then through the ends of those open pipes. And if, uh, if you're doing relatively small scale um, on farm composting, likely just one or two of those pipes will be sufficient. Um, de depending on how your machinery are running around, you can run that either right down through the middle of a long windrow or um, perpendicular to, to building your windrow and approximately one pipe every eight feet will, is likely to give you enough um, aeration. Again, as been, has been said, every, every compost pile is, is a little bit different um, being, uh, depends on your, your location and materials. Um, and again, around that pipe, it's important to have um, highly porous materials such as wood chips to encourage that air to be distributed throughout the rest of the material. Okay, great. Um, okay, we have a person who's still concerned about attracting coyotes. Is there anything yeah. more that one can so, do? Yeah, <laughs> so, well, yeah, so if you have, if you have manure, um, that really helps a lot. So, again, it's, it's very important to just have enough material around the body um, at least two feet of material to um, absorb any odors and, uh, and to just cover the, the body. Um, but manure does a particularly good job at concealing any you know, dead animal smells. Um, you know, you, you, you could also do things like build a fence um, around your, your composting location or even uh, just lay uh, lay wiring uh, over the top of the, the compost pile and, and stake that down on the sides. Okay. Um, do you have any recommendations for folks that have on-farm slaughter? So we're actually only composting the offal. Yeah, offal um, composts very well. Uh, you, you generally have um, uh, fewer bones or um, bones are often cut in that material. So offal works particularly well. Um, yeah, with that, you just want to, you probably will make um, not only the base, but also a little bit of the sides uh, so that you are building a, a full bed um, to put the offal into. Um, I, I, I admit, well, it's all a little bit gross, but it, it looks somewhat like a, a meat Twinkie when you do this. <laughs> so you'll have the um, filling of, of offal with the base material underneath and then feed stocks all around. But offal works very well. Okay, um, let's see. This person says, I realize the talk was about farm animals, but I thought that similar research was being done on humans at your university. Is there any update on that? Yes, um, I have been uh, engaged in that research. Um, 
And the process for humans is called natural organic reduction. It is now uh, legal in Washington state. And uh, I believe Colorado and California also legalized it this year, or at least there, it was introduced into uh, those legislatures this year. Um, I believe there's actually one facility that has been licensed in Washington already. And I know that another is going to open uh, in the South Seattle area in November. Okay. Um, will composting animals with internal parasites kill the parasites? Generally speaking, yes. Um, so again, this may be something that you want to contact your uh, uh, state veterinarian about, but uh, yes, um, any, um, any soft-bodied organism is going to be destroyed by that, that heat. Um, the concern might be in some eggs that may be um, highly, uh, highly heat resistant. Hmm. Okay, yeah, that's sort of the, the next question. Could I spread the compost from the parasite mortality and not worry about spreading the parasite on the pasture? So it sounds like that's a question, depending on the parasite and whether or not those eggs can survive the process. Yeah, you know, so I, I haven't read every paper available, but, but from the papers that I have looked at for, um, you know, uh, worms, for instance, those have been essentially fully destroyed through the composting heat. Now, again, it is, that's why it's, it's very important to ensure that you have uh, sufficient heat inside and uh, to make sure that the, the body of the, the uh, animal is within that heat and not e exposed to the cooler temperatures outside. Okay, great. Um, let's just give another minute or so in case anyone else has um, questions. We have about eight more minutes um, left, so don't be shy. Um, if you have a question, very likely it can be answered. Um, so I'll just give another minute here. Um, and meanwhile, I just want to mention again that this recording will be available within approximately a week on the eOrganic YouTube channel. So it doesn't look like we're getting any more questions right now, um, but I'm sure that the presenters wouldn't mind if you contacted them also um, if you have a question after the presentation. I don't know if that's true, but I would imagine that that's the case. Is that okay? Um, Certainly. Lynn and Rachel? Okay, great. Yeah, so um, thank you very much, Lynn and Rachel, for this very Im informative presentation. And um, thanks to everyone for all your great questions and for joining us today.